Russia is building an army of robots. Some parents are arming themselves this Halloween night and the perilous whiteness of pumpkins. It's Skywatch TV for Monday, October 31st, 2016. I'm Derek Gilbert. First up, Hillary Clinton got an early trick Friday. FBI Director James Comey notified Congress that the Bureau was taking a new look at Hillary's use of a private email server while she was Secretary of State. That's a violation of laws covering how federal employees handle classified information. Investigators found some 650,000 emails on a laptop used by disgraced former Congressman Anthony Weiner, the estranged husband of Clinton's top aide, Huma Abedin. Metadata from those emails suggests that thousands of them could have been sent to or from Clinton's private email server. Now, this is obviously getting a lot of attention today, this story breaking just over a week from the presidential election. So I'll try not to focus on the political infighting or stories that the media, the major media can cover in a lot more depth. But there are a few aspects of this I want to look at. Obviously, there are political implications, of course, with the presidential election next week, Tuesday. The big question, of course, is why did Director Comey do this so close to the election? There are a number of theories about this. Some indicate that there was a backlash from agents inside the FBI and a growing number of resignation letters from agents who were disgusted that the Bureau did not recommend an indictment of Hillary Clinton back in July. That's when Director Comey held a press conference to announce that he was closing the investigation. But remarkably, in that press conference, detailed all of the information, the evidence that had been collected against Hillary Clinton that made it look to everybody for all the world like there was a dead lock, dead to rights case against Mrs. Clinton for breaching national security, uh, obstruction of justice, tampering with evidence, destruction of evidence, deleting those 30,000 emails after receiving a subpoena and perjuring herself before the FBI and before Congress. Not to mention, of course, Bill Clinton's little chance meeting on the tarmac in Phoenix with the Attorney General Loretta Lynch, James Comey's boss. And we're supposed to believe at that meeting that uh, Clinton and Lynch only talked about their grandkids. So why? Why did Director Comey reopen the investigation now? Some believe that he may have felt guilty over the damage done to the reputation of the FBI for closing the file in July. Others believe he might have been worried that Republicans would open an investigation into his handling of it, uh, probing for political partisanship in not recommending charges against Mrs. Clinton. And that when the emails apparently related to Hillary's personal server turned up on the laptop shared apparently by Huma Abedin and Anthony Weiner, Comey jumped at the excuse to redeem himself and restore the agency's reputation. Now, just for a quick thought, Sharon and I are both very electronically oriented. We both have multiple electronic gizmos and devices, and we don't share a laptop. We use them too much to share a laptop. So the question is, how do those emails get to Wiener's laptop, which was being investigated because of the pornographic texting that he was doing with a minor, allegedly. Well, there's another theory to explain James Comey's actions. Now, I thought back in July when Director Comey announced he was closing the investigation, that he was just being pragmatic, that he knew that there was no way any charges brought by the FBI or recommended by the FBI would ever result in a conviction under the Obama Justice Department, which would have allowed Hillary Clinton to claim that she had been exonerated of these charges. So instead, Comey recommended no charges be filed, but during the press conference, he put all that evidence out into the public sphere so that we, the American voter, could make an informed decision when deciding who to elect as our next president. In other words, it's possible that Mr. Comey, doing what he did in July, was to take a bullet to his own personal reputation so that you and I would have an informed choice. By all accounts, Director Comey is an intelligent man, a man of integrity, and he was vetted eight ways to Sunday before he was confirmed by the Senate. Now, the other half of this theory, which is not my own, I just read a lot of people who know Washington better than I do, goes like this. Director Comey knows what's on the Wiener laptop, 
and knows that it's so serious that it's ultimately going to get out, especially if these reports of an insurrection inside the FBI are true. Somebody's going to leak it to the press and that he had to do something before the election so that he could not be charged with concealing evidence of a crime, clear evidence of a crime that the American voters should have known about which of course could result then in charges being brought against a sitting president or president elect. Now there's no way his investigators are going to sort through 650,000 emails by next week, Tuesday. So rather than wait until next year, when it would be even more difficult for this information to be used, in other words, bringing charges against a sitting president, James Comey went to Congress on Friday hoping that the shock of reopening the investigation, and it certainly has shocked Democrats, would cause voters to really, really think about whether Hillary Clinton should be trusted with access to classified information ever again. Now, of course, Director Comey is being raked over the coals by Democrats, even accused of possibly breaking the law by Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid. In other words, it's possible that James Comey is now taking a second bullet to his reputation in order to do the right thing by the American voting public. It's also possible that whatever is on that laptop is so damaging, and Director Comey may know about it, that if he hadn't reopened the investigation, no matter when he did it, now or later, he would have caught much worse abuse from Republicans in Congress. However you slice it, Director Comey's in a no-win situation. If he doesn't reopen the investigation. Republicans will castigate him. And of course, he is catching hell right now from Democrats for doing so. Ed Klein, New York Times bestselling author of four books about Bill and Hillary Clinton, has an article published at the Daily Mail today. That's a newspaper based in uh, the UK. He believes that Comey was forced to reopen the investigation by pressure from inside the bureau, but also from inside his own home. His wife, Patrice, apparently not happy that he didn't press for charges back in July. She's been urging him, according to Klein's sources, to admit that he was wrong and reopen the case. Klein writes that the people Comey trusts are the ones who are most angry with him. Again, he's in a very difficult situation. I do not envy FBI Director James Comey. Now, here's an aspect of the case I hadn't considered. Dr. Jerome Corsi, who is a staff writer at WND.com, World Net Daily, reminds us in an article today that Huma Abedin may have violated national security laws by forwarding email with classified information from her state.gov account to her private email account. One of, well, private email accounts, actually, one of which was at uh, yahoo.com. Apparently, when the State Department released emails pertinent to the investigation into Hillary's private email server, it was discovered that about two-thirds of the emails released from Huma Abedin had been forwarded to private accounts. Several of those emails contained such sensitive information that the State Department redacted them completely. It was nothing but blank spaces where the text would have been. Now, remember about a month ago, I reported on a story where Yahoo admitted that in 2014 it had been hacked and that hackers had stolen at least half a billion accounts. Half a billion accounts. In other words, <laughs> and this included passwords, names, email addresses, even in some cases the security questions and answers they ask you in order to confirm that you are who you say you are. It's entirely possible that somebody out there, some hacking group or organization or state perhaps, now has the login information, and has had for two years, to the account humamabedin at yahoo.com, and access to the completely unredacted versions of those highly sensitive emails released by the State Department. In other words, she may very well have compromised national security. Now, adding to the drama of what is most definitely the most interesting and eventful presidential election in my lifetime, WikiLeaks announced on Twitter Sunday night that it is about to launch phase three of its election coverage. I have no idea what that means. But strap yourself in because this is a wild ride that ain't over yet. One more victim of the dealings of Hillary Clinton 
the interim Democratic National Committee chair, Donna Brazile, was let go by CNN. She'd been serving as a political analyst for the network, although her contract was suspended when she stepped in as the interim chair for the DNC over the summer. Uh, That was after the resignation of Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who was outed by WikiLeaks as conspiring behind the scenes with the Clinton campaign to torpedo the presidential campaign of Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. Well, as it turns out, according to information released by WikiLeaks, emails released by WikiLeaks, Donna Brazile was feeding questions from debates and candidate town hall events hosted by CNN to the Clinton campaign. So, Brazil has parted company with CNN, says it's very uncomfortable with her interactions with the Clinton campaign. Brazil's reaction on Twitter, please God, let this end soon. In other news, yes, there is other news out there in this world. Pope Francis, apparently heading for the heart of godlessness, a.k.a. Sweden. He's visiting Sweden this week, taking part in a joint Catholic-Lutheran service to mark the start of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Kicked off by Martin Luther, of course. This is the first papal visit to Sweden in 30 years. And in a survey last year, the reason I call Sweden the heart of godlessness, and I I do that somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but a survey last year indicated that nearly 80% of Swedes said that they were either not religious or convinced atheists. The creepy clown meme has added a disturbing element to an already disturbing holiday, that is Halloween. Some parents in Florida say they're planning to arm themselves. We're talking with sidearms as they take the kids out tonight in case they are menaced by creepy clowns. One woman interviewed said that she doesn't have a gun, but she's taking a baseball bat. Police patrols around the country will be increased, but of course that's typical for Halloween night. Let's just pray that somebody's idea of a scary joke doesn't get somebody shot tonight. Coming up, the inherent racism of pumpkin spice lattes and college feminists lose their minds. That's ahead on Skywatch TV. The United States Congress knows of a threat to our nation that could kill 90% of us within a year, but they've done nothing to prepare. That's the basis of the new film, Amerigeddon, now available on DVD. Order Amerigeddon from the Skywatch TV store and you'll get the books When Once We Were a Nation. And I predict what 12 global experts believe you will see before 2025. These books include chapters by best-selling authors Tom Horn, Joel Richardson, Carl Gallup's, Mark Biltz, and others. Plus Skywatch TV personalities Josh Peck, Sharon K. Gilbert, Derek Gilbert, and more. That's a $60 value for just $19.95. Order Amerigeddon now by calling toll-free 844-750-4985 or log on to skywatchtvstore.com. Welcome back to Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. The U.S. government has ordered family members of employees of the consulate in Istanbul to leave, return to America. The State Department says the warning was prompted by fears of extremist groups targeting Americans in Istanbul. And meanwhile, the aftershocks from the failed coup in Turkey back in July continue. The Turkish government has fired another 10,000 civil servants, mainly from the education, justice, and health ministries. The government also announced the closure of 15 pro-Kurdish and other media outlets. So far, more than 35,000 people have been arrested in crackdowns on dissidents since the failed coup. Many more teachers, police officers, and judges have either been suspended or fired. And a Christian icon in Istanbul, the Hagia Sophia, has been seized by the Turkish government. The Hagia Sophia was built in the year 537 AD, was a Christian church for almost a thousand years until the Byzantine Empire was conquered by Muslims in 1453. After the collapse of the Ottoman Empire about a century ago, the Hagia Sophia was closed as a mosque, reopened as a, as a museum, and declared a neutral place for people of all faiths, Christians, Jews, Muslims, whoever. Well, earlier this year, the government of President Tayyip Erdogan, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, announced that the Muslim call to prayer would be sung twice a day, at the Hagia Sophia, Christians were alarmed, were told by the government, not to worry, it's only twice a day. Well, as of last Friday, 
a permanent imam for the Hagia Sophia has been appointed and the call to prayer now being sung five times a day. Basically, the Hagia Sophia has been turned back into a mosque. Keep your eyes on Turkey. President Erdogan has dreams of restoring the glory of the Ottoman Empire. Russia investing heavily in drones and robots. This warning coming from Deputy Prime Minister Dmitry Rogozin. This comes after Russia's only aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, was mocked by the British press after it sailed through the English Channel. Notice the smoke belching out of the stack there. Not something you see from American aircraft carriers. British press called it a rust bucket, but uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, uh, Rogozin says that we're investing heavily in technology. You just wait. We're going to unleash a high-tech military within years with smart drones, smart robots. And our friend Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, author of the new book Future War, says there's evidence that the Russians have already been deploying some early models of these remote-controlled battle bots in Syria. And speaking of Syria, the battle for Aleppo there and the battle for Mosul next door in Iraq continuing. Pro-Iranian militia attacking a town about 35 miles west of Mosul in western Iraq. This helps complete the circle uh, around Islamic State forces in Mosul and cuts off supply lines between Mosul and its headquarters in, Iraq, in Raqqa, Syria. But analysts say this maneuver is more about establishing a secure land route from Iran to Syria so that Hezbollah and Shiite militia troops can join the fight against rebels in Syria on behalf of President Bashar al-Assad. And this plan, according to some intelligence sources, was not coordinated with U.S. commanders, but with Russian military commanders. And ironically, since the United States has provided weapons, including Abrams tanks, and M198 howitzers to some of the forces attacking Mosul, it's possible that some of this military hardware will wind up in Syria and under Russian control. From England, another reason to keep cash in your wallet. Credit card machines at the Asta supermarkets around the country crashed over the weekend. Americans, just to get an idea how serious this is, Asta is a subsidiary of Walmart. So just imagine on a weekend, all of the credit card machines at your local Walmart Supercenter going out at the same time. Now you have an idea. Some customers stuck in line for more than an hour to pay. Some stores brought old credit card reading machines out of storage to process transactions, but others only accepted cash, advised customers to go hit up ATMs. Of course, then lines developed at the ATMs just as long as the lines of the checkout counter. But let this be a lesson. You may have money in the bank, but if a store can't connect to the Internet, to confirm that your money is in the bank or to process a credit card or debit card transaction, you're stuck, unable to buy or sell. Incidents like this may be the thesis of the Hegelian dialectic that will ultimately lead to the mark of the beast. The antithesis being the war on crash or cash that I've been tracking. The idea that only uh, Drug dealers, terrorists, and tax cheats carry around large amounts of uh, money, physical folding money. The synthesis will be the mark in the hand or forehead, a secure way to conduct transactions without having to depend on the uh, unreliable internet, perhaps, or uh, on a, a debit card that you can lose or have stolen. Now, this story uh, appropriate for Halloween, according to a scholar at the University of British Columbia, Pumpkins are symbols of white privilege. Yes, the study titled The Perilous Whiteness of Pumpkins uh, examines the symbolic whiteness associated with pumpkins in the United States. Pumpkins analyzed through the lens of racism. An entire section of the study devoted to the inherent whiteness of pumpkin spice lattes. You see, and I didn't know this, but thank goodness for scholars, PSLs are a luxury item. And as such, they are a marker of distinction and white privilege. The author of the study calls out Starbucks, the coffee chain, for promoting coffee house or coffee shop culture with its gendered and racial codes, which really has to irritate the owner, founder of Starbucks, who is really, really progressive. And a college women's group has canceled its annual performance of a play by, about, and for women because it's insensitive to women. 
they say. The Women's Initiative, a group at American University, is done with its annual production of a, a play that contains the, the name of a woman's reproductive organs. We'll, we'll call the play the V Monologues. Uh, why? They say it's because it's an antiquated way of viewing gender. In other words, the play is insensitive to women who don't have a V. Now, we have a word for women who don't have female reproductive organs. It's men. Now, they're replacing the production with a performance about body parts in general called the Breaking Ground Monologues. And as silly as this sounds, American University is not the first college to do so. Several others have replaced the V monologues with the Breaking Ground monologues, all in the name of not offending women who don't have female organs. The author of the V monologues told Time Magazine last year that uh, this was never intended to be a play about what it means to be a woman. It is and always has been a play about what it means to have a V. And I guess it's true. I mean, having one is different than not having one. So essentially, the students at American University and other colleges are saying that a show about a particular experience, then, is offensive because it excludes people who have different experiences, which means you can make an argument for shutting down every production of every type of performance or art ever. Welcome to our brave new world. And thank you for watching as we keep watch. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV. himself and restore the agency's reputation. Now, just for a quick thought, Sharon and I are both very electronically oriented. We both have multiple electronic gizmos and devices, and we don't share a laptop. We use them too much to share a laptop. So the question is, how do those emails get to Wiener's laptop, which was being investigated because of the pornographic texting that he was doing with a minor, allegedly. Well, there's another theory to explain James Comey's actions. Now, I thought back in July when Director Comey announced he was closing the investigation that he was just being pragmatic, that he knew that there was no way any charges brought by the FBI chance meeting on the tarmac in Phoenix with the Attorney General Loretta Lynch, James Comey's boss, and we're supposed to believe at that meeting that uh, Clinton and Lynch only talked about their grandkids. So why, why did Director Comey reopen the investigation now? Some believe that he may have felt guilty over the damage done to the reputation of the FBI for closing the file in July. Others believe he might have been worried that Republicans would open an investigation into his handling of it, uh, probing for political partisanship in not recommending charges against Mrs. Clinton and that when the emails apparently related to Hillary's personal server turned up on the laptop shared, apparently, by Huma Abedin and Anthony Weiner, Comey jumped at the excuse to redeem agents inside the FBI and a growing number of resignation letters from agents who were disgusted that the Bureau did not recommend an indictment of Hillary Clinton back in July. That's when Director Comey held a press conference to announce that he was closing the investigation but remarkably, in that press conference, detailed all of the information, the evidence that had been collected against Hillary Clinton that made it look to everybody, for all the world, like there was a dead lock, dead to rights case against Mrs. Clinton for breaching national security, uh, obstruction of justice, tampering with evidence, destruction of evidence, deleting those 30,000 emails after receiving a subpoena, and perjuring herself before the FBI and before Congress. Not to mention, of course, Bill Clinton's little ch
Russia is building an army of robots. Some parents are arming themselves this Halloween night and the perilous whiteness of pumpkins. It's Skywatch TV for Monday, October 31st, 2016. I'm Derek Gilbert. First up, Hillary Clinton got an early trick Friday. FBI Director James Comey notified Congress that the Bureau was taking a new look at Hillary's use of a private email server while she was Secretary of State. That's a violation of laws covering how federal employees handle classified information. Investigators found some 650,000 emails on a laptop used by disgraced former Congressman Anthony Weiner, the estranged husband of Clinton's top aide, Huma Abedin. Metadata from those emails suggests that thousands of them could have been sent to or from Clinton's private email server. Now, this is obviously getting a lot of attention today, this story breaking just over a week from the presidential election. So I'll try not to focus on the political infighting or stories that the media, the major media can cover in a lot more depth. But there are a few aspects of this I want to look at. Obviously, there are political implications, of course, with the presidential election next week, Tuesday. The big question, of course, is why did director Comey do this so close to the election? There are a number of theories about this. Some indicate that there was a backlash from agents.